It's an audience, this is really, Matt deserves an audience of sort of 150, if not, you know, 200 at least. But, um, so we're really, really privileged just to have Matt talk to us tonight. And um, I've known Matt really quite a long time. And, uh, <laughs> uh, going, back to, going back to when he was quite a youngster, so that kind of really ages and dates me. But um, he's had incredible success over the last years, and um, I know that uh, what he's going to talk about tonight is going to be of uh, really, really uh, high value and interest um, to all of us in different ways, shapes and forms. Um, we are recording, so you know, when it comes time to uh, you know, barrack and um, you know, just, just go easy on him. <laughs> uh, but it will be on the website um, uh, as, as all the other curious cow talks about when we're, when we're finished. Um, so, without any sort of further ado, I'd like to introduce Matt Rogan to you. Thanks, Matt. Cheers. Matt Rogan. Uh, evening, everyone. Thanks for taking some time when Britain's resurrection as a tennis nation in the Davis Cups getting covered on Radio 5 in about half an hour's time. I won't cram it into half an hour, but I won't take up all of your evening tonight. Um, a bit throaty as well, because I was travelling around the States with lots of cattle class airlines last week so if you can't hear how all the voice goes then just come closer um, or if you're struggling just go and sit on the sofa so you know, it can go either way uh, thanks to say for spending some time what i'm going to try and do today is is tell you a little bit of a story about the last 50 months that we've seemed to have built a bit of a monster of a business slightly by accident um, and I'm not going to labour the corporate stuff, so I'm not going to labour kind of the what we do or the how we work or any other kind of marketing shtick. What I'm going to try and do is take it out into the world of here's some things that we learnt along the way, not just I learnt, but I think our whole senior team learnt along the way that I would hope will have value. Um. It's going to be challenging. I would hope will have value. You know, whether you, you run a kindergarten, whether you play a role, looking to develop a business coach, you know, whatever it might be, I hope we'll have some value for you. Um, please feel free to barrack along the way. Okay, don't, don't feel like you need to, need to just be, be presented to, please feel free to, to jump in. So I guess, as Mike said, um, a little bit of context to me. Um, that's the best forehand I could muster on the practice wall a few months ago. I've been injured actually this summer, but tennis is in my blood. Uh, my mum um, still plays and, and coaches. Dad didn't. Um, and and the, the reason I love this picture is not because I managed to get broadly in a in kind of old school forehand pose when hitting that forehand, but that's my son hitting forehand at exactly the same time in a lesson with Hutch. And, and I guess this place as well has been in our blood. Um, I was probably coming a while ago to cancer training with Mike here um, when there was only one dome when the courts just in front of us here were, were ramshackle at best and so to, to be in this kind of structure I guess is a similar phase of what well, the right focus and attention you can do to build something pretty special. Um, what I thought I'd do is, is just kick off by giving you a little bit of context into what two circles does, only insofar as it, I hope it will be relevant to, to what follows. Um, I, I guess I've worked in the area of kind of sports and entertainment marketing pretty much my whole career, um, but my, my background before that was as a strategy consultant. So I was almost always kind of interested in the big numbers that get bandied around about all things sports. So Barcelona has 18 million Twitter followers, or you know, Ascot spends 50% of its marketing, marketing horse races on posters on the um, um, down the underground or somebody sees it to make good commercial sense uh, to spend nine million pounds on a brand new sponsoring a brand new stadium Saracens. I was kind of always interested in those things but kind of figured yeah, it seems like there's a bit of hot air underneath that. I don't really understand how people can actually evidence that that stuff's valuable. You know, how, what, what's this, the, the hard evidence that shows that the gym over there has paid off. What's the hard evidence that shows that when the big investment bank do spend nine million pounds on, on sponsoring and building the new Saracen State, it actually works? Um, and it was kind of that, I guess, numerous scepticism that enabled us when uh, my wife, Claire, also a member here, and my two kids who play here, uh, myself and our business partner, Gareth, who sat around at this our kitchen table 
uh, through the summer of 2011, we were trying to work out how we could um, how we could set up a business that would answer some of those questions, and how we could set up a business that tried to bring a bit of science into what, being honest, had been a pretty airy fairy world of sports marketing until that point. Um, I, I have to say that when I first showed this slide in a presentation, I got an absolute bollocking off my wife. Why did you use the chair that's got a big chip out there? We've got plenty of chairs that don't. So, you know, I've told you the secret of this slide now. I did, I did claim to have brought you tidied up. It never looks like this. Um, but that's where we were sat through, sat through the summer of 2011. But in the midnight oil, I was, I was working at another company at the time. Uh, and, and ultimately what we did in order to try and answer that challenge was set up two circles. Um, why two circles? You know, what was the, the reason behind the name? Uh, there's a couple of things. Firstly, um, I guess the official reason, um, which doesn't have any personality in it. So the official reason was when we start working in any sport, we tend to find that you have the sport, the club, the league, the whoever here, and the customer here. Okay, and they're both a bit frustrated. They're two separate circles. They're both a bit frustrated. They don't know more about the other one. You know, the, the, the fan, the customer, the whatever, would love to know more about their sport and really be able to get inside it. And at the same time, the sport's frustrated because it doesn't really understand how to engage with it and, and really make sense of its customer base. And that's the challenge, the two separate circles that we were set up to, I guess, to try and help with. And in doing so, I'll come on to this, give the evidence underneath kind of how things work and use data as a means of doing that. The personal reason is, um, is sadly not principally mine. So my business partner, Gareth, uh, was a GB 800 meter runner. So when he used to speak to girls at discos back in the day, the day with discos was still a word anyone used, um, he used to say, ran, work, ran around in circles for really. Um, I kind of post-rationalise it for me, so I grew up playing two sports, two ball sports, football and tennis. They were my two circles, but the reality is it is. Um, in order to, to kind of make some sense of what we do, what I, th I thought we might do is, is just give you a working example. This one's taken from cricket. Cricket was, is the heritage of our business. Without cricket, I would still be in my, my old uh, employment. And, and cricket were the guys that took a risk on us. And the kind of work we do in cricket, how many people do you think are involved or buy something or engage with an email or something in cricket every year up and down the country? Roughly? Spot on. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah. 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 Very good. Um, uh, and I guess when we started, well, the reason for these, these blue characters is when we started our work in cricket, all those people looked the same. I right? just had a lot of different I you know, had an email database where people sent emails to, a massive ticketing system, all the people who bought 2020 tickets and all that kind of thing. These different pools of information, and they all just looked like homogeneous people. They didn't know anything about them or understand them. And I guess for that reason, the sport generally, it's a bit of a headache, right? Kind of going, ugh, how do I make sense of all this stuff? But, I, but intuitively, I know I should be able to do something like this, just like Amazon do something with it to enable me to buy things based on what I've seen before. And I guess our, our job is to stop that headache and isolate people down at a single level. Okay, so what we do and the, and the work we do for our clients say, okay, stop all this chaos. We'll help you understand more about every person as an individual. So what that actually looks like, um, let's make that, that real for you. So we, so we might find an individual um, and find out for all this ticketing data, they spend about 490 quid on tickets over the course of the last five years. Now, they might be from different test grounds, right? And you might only be putting that data from different test grounds. You can see they've been to the Oval once, um, maybe they've been to uh, Edgbaston once, and maybe they've been up north to, to Yorkshire once. But they might actually only have gone to watch India each time. That could be the common clue amongst all the games they played. You might also notice that they've been on the ECB website, like right, looking for somewhere to play the game. Right? And you know that because you can use smart web cookies and things. One of the good cookies get a lot of criticism on websites and things. Because they think, you think well, wrongly used, don't get me wrong, they can be used and they can be pretty potent, slightly annoying commercial animals. This is an example where you can use them to strive for, for an impact. So you could find out this person's been looking for somewhere to play the game. But on discovering they live in Wales, you could then see that from all the league 
data coming in in Wales have never actually played a game. Mm. You could also notice that they've been on a part of the website and put a, a cricket bat in a chopping basket. Okay, but it's a junior cricket bat. And they might have registered for 12th man England supporters um, scheme that, that runs it in cricket here. And in doing so, you might notice they've gone to a new address. Okay, so address has changed from the ticketing records and things that have gone previously. And in doing that, they might have given you their Twitter handle and given you permission to take a look inside their, their, their Twitter followers. And there are a lot of them. And principally, this person, named Devesh, Devesh is one of our guys in the company actually, mm -hmm. tweets, tweets a lot, but about sport. Okay, so you can kind of get a sense of, from all that amorphous data all over the place, once you start to understand individual level, you start to get four million different stories. You start to just get clues as to how that person engages with sport. I guess our job is, is mostly to help um, the sport synthesize that data down. And secondly, to do responsible, smart, intelligent, commercially savvy things with that information. So, treat them like they want to be treated. How many people are under 35 in here? Oh, God. <laughs> Good work. Okay, so you lot, we would, we would never send you lot an email. You don't read emails. Even the people in my bloody company don't want to send emails and don't read them in front of 35. <laughs> Talk to them in the media that they consume. Talk, use the channels that they consume to have the conversation. In Devesh's case, it would clearly be Twitter. You talk to them about things that are coming up that you know they're going to be interested in. Remember this 490 quid, only against India? Registered again for 12th man, England supporters team. Why do you think he's done that? Well, probably because he wants to see India play in. You start engaging that individual with a, you start sort of saying, okay, well, been looking somewhere to play but hasn't played. Let's sort of talk to him about a club that's in his locale, don't forget, we know where he lives, but that welcomes people coming back to the game. And finally, with a sort of commercial piece starts to play out, well, if he's moved to this location and you know that to support T20 Blast and that way to run in promotion in their local branches and there's one a mile and a half down the road, tell him about it. Yeah, and I, and I guess what this isn't about is about, it's not about sending more emails, blasting people with stuff. It's about just helping one individual consume sport in a way they might like to consume it. I'll give you another example, um, an ATP. Right? So, if, so if you happen to be um, a consumer of tennis TV, Yeah, go on, subscribe to Sense TV. I do. So, you can get up on the App Store. You just watch ATP tournaments and stuff that aren't available elsewhere. You can watch them all through, um, through the app and watch them on your iPad if your kids are pollinating the television. Mm -hmm. uh, and essentially, if we start to understand how this punter Nick engages with tennis, which events he watches, which he doesn't, it's sold on a subscription basis, um, and we start to realise through Twitter, He's Scottish, Andy Murray fan, follows Andy Murray, some of those kind of things. We happen to know Andy Murray's playing in Shanghai um, in a tournament that's not on mainstream TV or at three o'clock in the morning. You can tell him about it. Okay? This is a similar narrative in the, in, the, in the sports space. It's just trying to be smart with almost half being a sleuth with the data you hold and half helping sports use that to drive what's hopefully a more compelling commercial proposition for them and a more engaging experience for the customer. Because half the time, if I knew Andy Murray was playing at the time of night, or I might go on TV actually, but if I knew he was playing um, at a time when I watched his pottery around, I'd probably watch, I'd probably play a couple of quid to watch. It's just knowing that, that that is available to you in exactly the same way that people, we want people up and down the country to know if there's a tennis Tuesday open to them especially if they haven't played a competitive tennis match in the course of the two, three years before that. Okay. It might help us understand why girls of a certain age lapsed in tennis earlier than earlier. There's all sorts of stuff underneath there in any sport. It's just providing the science, the evidence to help a sport, to help any sport that's traditionally, believe me, been based on finger of the air in terms of how it makes decisions. So, in four short years, we managed to, to crack on pretty quickly. So we've got about 50-odd clients 
Um, here are some of the people we're allowed to talk about. Sadly, there are a few um, we're not allowed to talk about. I've been lucky to hit the market, the right proposition, the right time, won a bunch of awards for the, for the kind of work that we do. Um, the ECB was our, was our first client, um, and we're lucky to have it spread across both professional and participation sport. And we try with our, with our teams to get people involved in both, because you learn all sorts of different stuff. And, and ultimately, we're all sports people. All of this lot are spending most of their weekends out there on pitches or courts or running tracks of some description. So that's a little bit about us, just to, to set the frame and set the context. Um, just to crystallise that, but also to give you a sense of the, of the culture. Oh, there we go. Um, Windows 10 is a wonder of Earth. Let me hang on a minute. Uh, it's F5, isn't it? It's F5 or a 7. Um, duplicate. Should we put it there? Seven, I think. No. Any chance I can get a quick? No. Now I've got both on duplicate. Get a quick hand. Yeah. All I'm trying to do is get our video on. Yeah. Okay. So five minutes. Where are we? Good man. Set one up. One down. No. No. Yes. Two. Three. Okay. Top man. Okay. okay, so um, start to give you a bit of a sense more of culture and, and this kind of stuff. This video was, um, was pulled together by a guy, that, um, a guy called Harry, a very, very talented analyst that we found desperate for a break, any break coming out of university right at the point at which it was almost impossible for somebody coming out of university to get a role of any description. And... Um, the brief essentially was to try and characterise what we do, how we do it, but also a bit of a sense of the culture behind the company. Um, this now sits on the homepage of our website, um, but describes more than me wittering on for another 15 minutes ever can about a gut, kind of what we're about. Hi, we are Two Circles. We thought this might be a good way to help you understand a little more about why we're here. We help sports organisations build stronger relationships with their customers. And we have proven methodologies which show that the most powerful way to do this is through data, hence data-driven sport. Our role is to help rights holders unlock the commercial value within their data. How do we do that? Well, we start by taking as much information as we can get about our clients' customers. In different contexts, that means ticketing, memberships, retail, hospitality, participation, not to mention social and web data. We make sense of it all and build the best customer strategy to solve the problem at hand. Whether that problem is selling sponsorship, setting stadium prices, or delivering content through the right channel that really resonates. We create and execute campaigns that are shaped by customer insight from start to finish. After all, in an increasingly digital landscape, data is everywhere. Everything from editorial to display advertising is made up of data. Digital is data. Across owned, earned, and bought media, it enables an increasingly compelling dialogue between sports organisations and their customers on every platform and every channel. Just as importantly, it allows us to help our clients measure how effective they've been and get even better next time. We believe that data is redefining sports marketing, and we're not the only people who think so. We were proud to win the most coveted sports agency award in the UK before our third birthday, and to be shortlisted again the following year. Not long afterwards, we became part of ESP Properties, a WPP company, continuing our role of providing commercial and creative advice to rights holders. Sounds exciting, right? Well, it is. We don't struggle getting out of bed in the mornings, but more importantly, it works. It works really well, and we can prove it. Our data-driven approach allows us to be evidence-based when demonstrating the value we add. As a result, we've been able to build long-term relationships with some great clients, 96% of them have chosen to continue working with us today. Perhaps that's because two circles are such an interesting bunch. After all, sports marketers today need to be many more things than they used to. We are strategists, but we are also data geeks. We are technologists, detectives, and storytellers. We are designers and marketeers, practical people for a commercial digital world. 
We are problem solvers. We come from all over the world, and as you'd expect from such a diverse bunch, we speak a lot of languages. Languages like HTML, C Sharp, SQL, JSON, and C++. The thing we've all got in common, and the only thing you really need to know about us, is that we've got sport in our hearts, and customers on our brains. We spend our days filling server after server, building campaign after campaign, helping our clients make smarter commercial decisions. Data isn't for geeks in dark rooms, it's for the boardroom. We help our clients take it there and use it to grow measurable commercial revenue. We're all about growth. At the end of the day, an agency like ours has to be. That's why we take so much pride in solving our clients' problems and proving the results. Going above and beyond. Being there when our clients need us most. We are two circles. And we believe in data-driven sport. So if you um, say a true lesson for everyone is that all of that's done on PowerPoint, I can do it, um, but it, all that kind of stuff can be done. And I guess that that characterises the challenge that, um, in many ways, we've we've had building the business, which is uh, how do you build a uh, presentation view? How do we do that? I can never remember. Is it that one? Yeah. No, it's black or unblack. That one. See all slides. No. Uh, <laughs> Um, I guess that characterises the, the challenge we've had, which is how do you capture that kind of talent um, of 23, 24, 25 and turn that into a 50 person business, recognising that actually you're not the person, you're not the people who know how to do this kind of stuff, but there's a bunch of talented generation coming up through our uh, working world who are computer native data literate, digital savvy, you. Um, and kind of who, who know how to do this stuff day in and day out. And ultimately, um, there you go. maybe just end the show and I can keep back to it for But ultimately that's what the challenge we've had because I think our average age is 29 in the business, right? It's scary. It's um, the average age of the um, ATP World Tour. Is it? Yeah. There you go. I just thought you might like that little bit of data. <laughs> oh, good work, mate. The only thing I would, um, I'd probably ask our lot 29 point what? 29.6. Oh, I'm getting Good work. Okay. So, so I guess that, that's the challenge. And what I put together really is just some thoughts on, on sort of what I learned along the way. and. Um, I guess I'm just, just going to share some things with you. Before I do, I've got 11 things I think we've learned along the way, but before I do, one, one thing that never ceases to amaze me is even in that group of 50 people, people learn differently. Right? And effectively, we've created a business that does something that's not been done in sport before. We've done that by taking hodgepodges of three or four different types of business, kind of fusing them together, kind of part track consultancy, part data geeks and part digital marketing agency. In order to do that, picking up how people learn has been fundamental. So picking up how you guys learn, hopefully with these, I'll show you some video, some talking, some slides, and you know, hopefully some Q and A, some interaction. You know, it's just trying to pick up on how different people learn has been absolutely fundamental because we've had to teach people, everyone who come in, we've had to teach them the business because we've been inventing the business as we go. It's kind of point one, it's, it's just really, I mean, you guys as coaches know it day in and day out, right? Picking out how somebody learns is the most fundamental thing to helping them progress. So my, my 11 things, I guess the first thing I, I sort of would say is, in order to lead well in any environment, you need to know where you're going. I know that sounds fairly obvious, um, but in a lot of the organisations that, that we work with, a lot of the organisations that, that I frankly I've worked in in the past, um, there's not been a really firm, clear direction of travel. Okay? And that's not a direction of travel that might have been held at the board, it might have been held in the senior management team, but it hasn't been held by everyone in the organisation. And that firm, clear organisational purpose, I would hope, has been one of the things that helps us move quickly because our guys and girls were able to make smart, quick decisions 
based on a rough frame of reference of where we think we need to be in a year's time. And intuitively, based on this decision, is this yes or no? And my own, I, nobody here to tell me what the answer is, but I can kind of guess based on where I think the organisation is trying to go. Uh, and this is ours, frankly. So, you know, why we exist. So our, our organisational purpose is to change the game of sports marketing. Not to do it a little bit differently, not to change it a little bit, not to change, not to create world peace either, to be really, really clear. We love to do our peace and we believe significantly in the value of sport, but we're not there for work. We're there to change the game of sports marketing, help it be done completely differently. Our purpose and what we do is help sport organisations build better relationships with their customers. And this is how we run our business. Anyone heard of a balanced scorecard? Okay, it's a really simple management tool that basically says across the business you, you're going to have different sets of priorities. There's only so many hours in a day even when you've got a startup. So effectively you have future, current, external and internal. Future internal is about your team. It's about the talent you're developing, the support you give them, the way you retain them, the way you reward them, and frankly the processes and controls and things you have in that space. External the future is about not your product offer today, but it's what you're looking to build in the future. Internal and current is about your processes and how well managed you are. In our world, we've got any money in the bank because we've got a lot of salaries to pay before our clients pay us. <laughs> external, current is about clients. How good is the work that we're doing? Is it the quality that needs to be to help us grow? And we balance all those four things. Our guys help us build the goals in each of those four areas that will ultimately will enable this. There's tensions inherent in all of that. My job really is to spend 25% of the time in each of the areas. I actually spend probably less time in the client space because that's where my business partner is. Gareth is, is phenomenal. Um, but ultimately, any business is, is so tempting when you sat the start and all you time here. And delivering client quality is important, but if you just deliver client quality, you just run around the, the hamster wheel quicker and quicker and quicker. I guess it's a bit like if you have a training business um, or, or a coaching business or any type of business, you're just focused on delivering kind of as many lessons as you can out in the court, but you're not thinking about where you're going. You probably end up with just filling all the hours in the day without really knowing where you're trying, trying to get yourself to. So that's been that first thing for, is we need to know where we're going as an organisation and I need to pull the organisation to there through that and help them under co-create this. Which, which brings me to point two really, which is the strategy is co-owned. So it's the job of the management team to set that direction, but ultimately the delivery of that is a, we, we, we run through the balance scorecard as well. But it, we build our plan each year through everyone else getting involved to all set the direction and then involve everyone else in kind of the, the things that we're going to go through in order to deliver on that direction. Um, <laughs> so this is, um, this is one of the sessions we had in the planning for this financial year. I feel a bit sorry for Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a bit of a running joke. So Lauren's our ops manager. Um, and you imagine being an ops manager, joining to be an ops manager of a 12-person business and having a 60-person business. Lauren spends a whole time kind of chasing her tail. So she spent some time in this session just saying, okay, this is what I do, this is the areas I'm focused on, this is how you can help me. Sort of a running joke that nobody really knows what she does because she does everything. Um, but, but that point of, of kind of especially um, to much to overuse term in that kind of millennial generation, for them to be able to see something in themselves, something of their contribution and the direction of the organisation is just fundamental to their engagement. And, by the way, it helps them make smart decisions day in and day out. The, the third thing in my list of 11 was just about interview. I fundamentally, we're, we're the same as, as, as Halton, we sell a personal experience. Right? We, sell, we sell people one way or another, whichever way, if you really strip it down. What's in their brains, their ability to code, their ability to send direct marketing, because the quality of our people is, is what matters. And so for us, um, interviewing is our product, in a lot of ways. So, and um, this, this is 154 people. Um, in our third year, I interviewed all of them. They were more interesting than this, <laughs> um, but I interviewed 154 people, so broadly three a week. Um, very weak with that whole And um, I said to be, I did that, I did all the first round interviews, and my interviews are for values fit and company fit. 
Because if you're growing that quick, there has to be something that glues people together. If you're going to build a sports team of 11 people, go out football pitch, there has to be something that bonds people together. And so my job was to make sure that bond was there. So after fit, we did capability. Okay, but that 154 hours of time I spent, have a moral discussion with myself sometimes, is if you know immediately they're not right, what's the minimum kind of moral <laughs> amount of time you should spend on an interview? I kind of come up about 35 minutes. I don't know if that's good or bad, but... Some of those can be quite painful when you've got the more technical development roles. Um, and ultimately, out of that came 23 people. Okay, now, now we looked at, I think, something like 1,300 CVs, got us down to 154, got us down to 23. But, but that's your product at the end of the day. Um, and what was, what was really interesting to us, it was actually, if you look at those Good looking 23 people. And this is just again, this is just a snapshot of a year. Um, so this is them at work and play. And one of the things that's important, I mean, you might, if, you, and if you've been on our website, we have a picture of somebody playing a sport and a picture of them kind of looking a bit more corporate. And the reason we do that is because none of them come, very few of them come from sport. If you're trying to develop a new product or a new service in an industry, that hasn't traditionally been very good at that service, why would you hire people from that industry? So if you look at the, the backgrounds of the individuals we brought in, Accenture, Deloitte, BP, Arsenal, Mattel, Van Humby, the data business behind Tesco's, straight out of university marketing, this is the guy that wrote the, um, the video. You know, you have to hire people from different backgrounds. And so that gel of, I want to be on a sports pitch with that person, but also that understanding of what it's like to be a punter, because they were on a sport pitch the whole time, was fundamental. Because if you're going in to change a sport, you have to be able to empathise with people, talking their language, even if your experience and background comes from somewhere completely different. Okay? So it's, it's a lead, you need to know where you're going. I'm not going to remember 11 of these. I lose it about the third day of Christmas, but it's a lead, you need to know where you're going. That strategy needs to be covered. And interviewing is your is the most important thing you can do in a day. In terms of what I spent my time with, the other thing I think is um, we have a certain working on as well as working in the business. And that relates a little bit to, to sort of not spending more time in that client quadrant. Okay, so the way we divvied uh, our roles up between Gareth, Claire and myself, um, the, the three board members, was that my job was principally to work on the business, not in the business. Does that make sense? So not, not work on the client stuff almost at all, but work on the development of the business. And, and frankly, that sounds very laudable, sounds very interesting, sounds quite easy to decide, but, but there are various proof points all right, where you have to stick to that. Because it's just like progression in um, anyone's sporting form. It's like, I'll, I'll watch for someone play tennis and have lessons with Hutch, and, and you know, the course of two months, you don't really see any change, and then something changes. Some, like, all of a sudden something clicks and kind of kicks off. And it's been a little bit like that from, for us. This is our monthly revenue, which you can kind of see since July 2012, a sort of generally a consistent growth picture month on month. And yet at the same time, you can kind of see like, a bit of a roller coaster. So you can kind of nice increase, settle, nice increase. Uh, and there, there are a couple of points here. You know, we started from scratch and settled, grown and settled, where I, I know I can sell and deliver work. So with that in mind, it's really tempting to get back into the client space and kind of really work hard and try to grow the, grow the revenue base. But actually, they're the moments, they're probably the moments you don't have the sleepless nights. You have some more sleepless nights because you're going, how do we keep the engine going here? But it's just about sticking to what you believe in, sticking to that. The, the premise of that, that balanced scorecard, those four things, is the equal focus on those four areas it's the best way to drive sustained growth. There's a load of stock market research into, into that. And I guess we, we've been fortunate or made our own luck in the basis that continuing to focus across the piece has worked for us. There's been a couple of moments where we've gone, are we doing the right thing? But fortunately, to date, it's been okay. The fifth one was about how we, how we work with our people. Um, I talked about that sort of having something that coalesced everyone in terms of the strategy and the vision for the organisation, but ultimately you've got to get people 
to find it easy to get out of bed in the morning. As Harry said in the video, I still don't find it easy to get out of bed in the morning. But uh, and that's about balance. Coaching framework, like you guys will know, balancing support and challenge. It's creating a, an organisation where if you have a compelling vision and you have high challenge and no support, people burn out. That's the investment bank kind of scenario. I'm just frazzled. You work your proverbials off for two and a half, three years and it's kind of game over. It's just challenge, 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 challenge. It's a little bit like training for a marathon and never having a damn week. We just, you just run out of steam. Same time, for competitive vision, really high support culture and no challenge, which becomes absolute anarchy and people just kind of wandering around doing what they doing what they fancy. I'm not really getting the best out of themselves because they're not setting themselves challenges, succeeding, moving on. So, so I guess we try really hard to balance the challenge inherent in setting up a new business with, with a load of support. Um, don't crush me, there we go. Come back. So, so it just gives you a bit of an example of, of some of the things we've tried to do in that regard. So that's just a little infographic portraying sort of some of the things that, that we have found is important. Um, Ultimately, sports marketing agencies have a reputation of treating their people appallingly. So for us, if we wanted people from BP, Deloitte and things to join us, we have to treat properly. Ultimately, being prepared to take people out, find work and focus on training in their own development, commit to that, pay for that, and not be pushed around by clients insisting stuff, insisting on stuff the next day has been one of those proof points for us. So actually encouraging people, sometimes forcing people to focus on their own development, it has been absolutely fundamental. Um, we found that getting people together in sort of team days and, and team afternoons and things has, has been really important to invest in the strategy of the company, right? Sometimes we have or have had 10 people joining a quarter. So you, kind of, you get to a team day environment, they don't know each other's names. You know, let alone what gets them out of bed in the morning, what their partners are up to, what sports they like, that kind of stuff. So just giving people time to be together along the fast paced journey has been really, really important. A couple of other things I think probably emphasise in that 360 feedback has been fundamental in the context of two performance review rounds a year. The thing that we've done, which I would recommend anyone do, is ask clients to contribute to that, whatever walk of life. So you run a formal review process but the feedback ultimately is from the customers as well as from peers. But English aren't very good at giving feedback, right? They feel deeply uncomfortable about it. So it's so actually just opening up into clients and stop people being nice to each other and start getting some objective, objective kind of hard evidence. We're, we're also pretty, you know, you don't get many sporting cultures and performance cultures that aren't pretty rigorous in terms of where people are at performance-wise. Uh, and we don't shy away from that. Um, so we use a... Silver doesn't look great, we use a bronze, silver, gold, fourth um, metric. And the most important thing that performance reviews is we ask people to self-rate before the review. I'm saying, where do, on, on your objectives, which are normally six to eight objectives, each one, do you think you'd be in gold, silver, bronze, fourth? And what, what, how would you self-rate yourself at the end of that process? And then we do the same thing for them. Uh, and the most revealing conversation then is where you say, on each one, you know, we think you're there, you think you're there, and you have a combination a conversation about where the difference is. It really works. Um, I would say if you work and hire the most intelligent people, 75% of the time they've self rated lower than you've rated them. And that changes the frame for a conversation where. Some of the time, they rate themselves higher than you rated them, and actually that's probably more your issue than theirs, because it's your feedback hasn't been good enough along the way. But it, that self-rating process around the feedback piece has been really important. The area we've been lucky is if you hire analytic, very driven people, actually what tends to happen is you end up with more people with silver and gold, and it's not a perfect distribution bell curve. And that's where we as a business have been really fortunate because our growth enables us to give me more people career ops. We're probably 18 months away from not needing to hire another senior person for another five years because we've got such a culture of talent coming up through. But they will only stay if we give them all the things on the last side. 
You alright so far? Yeah. Hang in then. Cool. Um, I think I've probably covered this, which is the, the responsibility of, of that constant feedback process. We use, we use a form um, to do that, and this is kind of a goal sort of blog for form. The, the other thing I'd add in there, though, is that uh, if that is your business plan, resolutions are great, if that's your business plan across those four areas, we make sure that people set themselves objectives in each of those areas. Okay? Because people don't join a business with 10 or 15 people just to do the job. They do it because they're interested in being part of an entrepreneurial journey. So we let some, some people focus on marketing for the website, some people focus on recruitment, some people focus on um, kind of building a business plan for the states and getting people involved in that broader piece and setting themselves objectives against those areas is, is really important. And ultimately that, as I've said, rating themselves against it as, as well as the organisation rating them. I, I guess the other thing I'd say is, is it's easy to have a strategy and it's easy to, have a, to deliver on the strategy. What isn't as easy as saying no? And you only know you've got a strategy, not when you say yes, but when you say no. Okay, so for each of you guys and girls in the room, you know, if you coach, at what point would you say no to taking on a coaching relationship? At what point would you say no to somebody joining the gym? You have to have some frame of reference for that. Some people have gut instinct, which is fine. Um, the problem is if you love sport and you work in sport, your gut instinct is pretty much perennially yes. Right? Or you care about people's development, your gut instinct is perennially yes. And so for us, we decided that, that what we wanted to do was, was actually just have some, have some rules. Right? So what's the right work? What do we know the right work looks like? Clients are we know we're getting it right when clients are recommending us unpromptly. Uh, clients are recommending us without prompting. Second engagement is bigger than the first. Clients, chief exec, speaks, speaks, speaks all of us, all those kind of things. So what are some signs that we're getting it right in the client? The process that we use for business development. And then what is the right work? Aligns and contributes to our vision. So we can see how this piece of work helps us get what we're looking to go to. We know we can solve the problem. That's really important because if we can't solve the problem, we ain't going to do a job. If we ain't going to do a good job, we work in a small industry, what is going to get around? So knowing we can solve the problem is absolutely fundamental. We can see the profitable revenue from this, even if the first bit won't be profitable, because in our space it really is. It really is, because you've got all that crunching. So. The client understands what they're buying. If clients understand what they're buying, then in our space that's going to get tricky one way or another. And we've pulled away from a few pieces of work, big high profile pieces of work, because our general sense was this isn't. It, this is the right solution for you, but you're not ready for it. Which isn't being arrogant, it's just about saying, we can do the best job in the world, but, but we think there's other stuff at play here that means that it won't actually land in the organisation. And, and uh, absolutely, we're fortunate because we've been growing, so we've been able to do that. We've had the luxury of being able to do that. Don't underestimate that for a minute. But these proof points are saying, is this the right piece of work for us? Do we take this one or this one or neither? and work on the business rather than do this client work has been absolutely fundamental. Okay, so, so that's all the, the kind of straighter business stuff. I, I guess, um, you know, the, the reality of it as well though is, you know, my, um, my wife had just had our, our second child when we set business up, right? So you've got a young family, um, husband being chief exec and a wife being FD, which is kind of an interesting environment. Um, the joke kind of went that there was only one room in the, in the house in which I was in charge. Then when we did the WPP, I wasn't even in charge in that room. Um, and ultimately, you know, it, it's, there's a lot goes on where you kind of have to create that distinction between what's going on at home and what's going on in the business. Um, having said that, it actually, uh, on a selfish level, it made it a lot easier to set up as a team and as an individual. You know, I have utter respect for people who do things like this on their own. I, I couldn't have done it. I, I, I just, I don't switch off well enough to be able to do it as a one. 
Uh, and the reality is, you know, whatever you do, if you care passionately about it, you want to win, and you throw so much into it, you look at this a lot. <laughs> you know, my, my, I actually sleep really well. I sleep very well, but I'm a nightmare for needing a wee about four o'clock. <laughs> and then I struggle. Right, if we've got stuff going on at home, then the cogs are even slightly start to turn, then I'm in trouble. And I think that's just the inevitability. Right? You can have all sorts of coping mechanisms for it, but the reality is, it's just bloody hard work. Um, and sometimes, you know, I always think that the frame of reference and the thing to, to kind of keep in mind is, well, what are the things that I'm worrying about? Actually, are they things I can control? Or are they just things in the reality of, of the world outside? which I can control and I influence. So being up in the morning, being up early, unable to sleep, thinking about how do we do a great job of the next performance review round? How do we do a great job of this big pitch we've got coming up? I can kind of live with because that's within our control. We've had various instances, you know, sports marketing is political, it's nasty at times. It's um, got a lot of big people in it, many of whom fortunately are starting to get their comeuppance. But if you set up a business and go to 60 people over, over four years, you're going to make enemies. Right? So the reality of people bitching and whining and, and trying to undermine what it is you do, you just have to let wash over you. Not easy. Frankly, I didn't manage it half the time, but that's the premise, right? So I've sort of, I've sort of reconciled myself to the fact that if I'm up at 4.15 in the morning thinking about things I can productively control, I can live with that. Go up at 4.15 in the morning, think about things I can't control, or people who aren't worth my time, that's what I kind of need to move away from. And whatever role you do in any organisation, you know, I'm sure there are, I know there are you know, members here who frankly just look for opportunities to have a winch. It's life, it happens, they watch over you. Easier said than done, but I guess if you're in that situation, I've been there too. Um, one, one thing I think that's, that's really important for us has been, so we've developed a product service called What One that's really worked. And um, it would be very easy on a Sunday night when you've got a shitload of excuse me, work to do before, before the next morning, it would be really easy to go, no, it's working, don't shift it. But actually we know, especially since WPP, we've got thousands of people come and try to replicate what we do, try to think about how they put their spell on it. That's business, it's just life, we not get better about it. But for that reason, you know, it's, it's no different to, to kind of being late and hear it, right? And, and thinking about the world's catching you up in terms of your tennis style. You know, the continuous improvement piece and thinking about how you can make the most of the talent you've got and how you stretch it, develop it, push it, has, has been fundamental. So the kind of, for us, it's, it's, it can be a difficult moment at times thinking this product ain't ever going to be finished. This service that we give is... is it's never going to be good enough for six months' time. And that's the reality of the market moving quickly. This is just one example of this. is a, probably our, one of the things we do best is evaluating the impact of marketing. So which of half of your marketing, Mr. Chief Exec of Harlequins, is working and not working? And this is a big process we're going through at the moment, led by a lady called Angie, just to develop the most efficient adopted email evaluation dashboards ever. Which sounds very dull. Um, and actually, you know, the process is, is pretty earthy, but the point is, is just the continuing innovation. You know, you don't stay number one if you're Djokovic by being as good next year as you are this year. You just have to push it, and you have to find the incremental. Dave Browse will call it marginal gains. You know, the 1% here, the 2% here, the 3% here, that helps you kind of crack on. Uh, and the other thing, um, and this is the one I really want to talk about. So I'm a, I'm a denim born and bred. Um, went to school in Amersham, very lucky to, um, to go to Dot Challenge back in a long commute, but a fantastic school. But if it taught me one thing, it was hardly worth hardly play. I was very fortunate to have parents who kind of still exactly the same thing in me. And um, from my perspective, there are a few things I couldn't have been on this journey without. I couldn't have been on this journey without actually being a team with uh, Trouble and Strife at home. I couldn't have been on this journey without a brilliant business partner. I couldn't have done it on my own. But I also couldn't have been on this journey without continually having the sport piece to balance me out. Because if I go home and watch crap TV, I don't switch off. If I go home and play FET football last night, I completely switch off. If I come in on Saturday morning and bash around with Adam McGrath on the tennis court for an hour, 
I could be anywhere in the world. So sport for me is a constant switch off. And I think it's really important to have those constant triggers to help you get over the 4.15 a.m. moments and give you the endorphins and downtime that you need. So for us and for me, you know, that happens to have been tennis, perhaps to be running, football, all the things that kind of help me just decompress. I don't believe anyone can sustainably lead a business without having those triggers that enable you to, to kind of just get out of the old routine. I should say the only reason I've won three tournaments uh, <laughs> since coming back after a series of disastrous injuries is firstly because um, I won the corporate games doubles when my partner didn't show up, so I played with a guy who was amazing, John Lewis. Um, and secondly, I won the men's doubles here a couple of times because Hush plays with me because he's nice. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, you take it, right? Uh, and the final piece, I think, is um, it's probably about recalibration of goals. And my sense is Amy Horton's there a little bit as well. You know, you kind of think, when you aspire to create something and you've created it, um, way beyond what you thought might ever be possible. This place is what Holton is way beyond what I ever thought might be possible when I was coming here and it was nearly falling down when I was 15. Um, you, ultimately, you, when you kind of build something, you go, right, where next? Where do we go next? Where, where, where's my personal development? Where's the development of my organisation to the next stage? Um, and this, this piece of press actually was in, um, was in a sports rag. Um, sports business rag uh, a couple of weeks ago, which kind of frames that for me. So, giants are emerging in the sports marketing landscape with multi billion dollar agencies coming to the fore. Kind of wish. Uh, since the beginning of 2014, w, uh, WME and IMG, you might have heard of, Infront, you might have heard of, and WPP to link up with two circles have forced the rest of the industry to sit up and take notes. In bloody ludicrous, like these guys are hundreds of millions of dollars of business and we hit this thing that started on the kitchen table four years ago. Um, but, but I guess the point there is, is ultimately this is saying um, the rivals have been forced to act, branching out to unknown territories. Frank Dunn looks at how the arrival of the newly merged forces has affected the balance of power in the sports industry. And it's kind of, on one level, it's, it's amazing and slightly ridiculous that we find ourselves in, in that kind of environment. Um, and yet, on another level, I guess it's, it's kind of, if you, if you climb up a mountain on a bike and you kind of get to a false top of the hill, so you kind of go to the top of one hill, you find yourself with deal with IMG, it's all, with, with WPP, it's all extremely exciting, and then you, somebody sets you the next cliff, and the next level, and the next point you shoot at, and that's where we are at the moment, really, which is just kind of saying, recalibrate all of ourselves and going, right, it's a time to go again. And, and everything we've, we've done and everything we've achieved to get to this point, you know, they're, they're probably not the right things to focus on in the next bit of jigsaw. You know, I imagine, say, in five years' time, the 11 things, maybe it's me, maybe it's somebody who's better than me in my job, but that's one of the things you have to countenance. We'll sat here talking to you about another 11 things and a different 11 things that are important in the next bit of the jigsaw. So, you know, those of us who've been driving cars when the kids have been screaming, are oh, we nearly there yet? Since the dawn of time, the reality is that I think in business, and might probably in life, like, you're never there. You're never even nearly there. And actually, it's just about times like this, frankly, it's, it's been fabulous from my perspective to use this opportunity just to reflect a bit on this bit of climbing up the mountain, because you just don't do that. You don't get halfway up and go, ooh, we're a bit high now. Um, and the reality is we're in that kind of recalibration process uh, a little bit at the moment. So I was thinking about um, how to sum up these 11 lessons, or 11, not lessons, um, 11 things that I think we've, we've learned along the way. Um, my background being like it is, I, I thought I'd, I'd do it this way. Uh, and I guess fundamentally, in terms of the, the formation we put together, he had, he had a good goalkeeper, he stuffed. Right, and for us, to lead well and know where you're going is absolutely fundamental. The next four, in terms of our back four, is, is in no particular order. Have a strategy, but make sure it's co-owned get the right people on the bus and commit on a personal level to getting those right people on the bus. Work on the business and challenge the people you have to focus on the right things at the right time. High support, high challenge. If you get the right people and, you, and, you, and the right people are driven, emotionally intelligent, analytically excellent people, then high support, high challenge is, is, is the way to go. It's a good test. You start to be able to be a bit more creative and a bit more touchy-feely beyond the tight back four. 
and, and the being touchy feely is kind of giving your guys and forcing them to reflect on their own performance as well as you telling them what you think and feedback to you how you think you're doing. Being really clear around what not to accept as well as to accept in terms of where you go forward. Uh, and now on a more emotional level, rise above all the crap that's going to get thrown at you. I try and recalibrate those 4.15 in the morning moments, the ones that were right and the ones that aren't. In my experience, they, they happen. And don't forget the personal balance that comes with, for me it was a head torch. I live in the, live in the countryside in the middle of nowhere. Um, and frankly, 95% of my running during the week is, is with a head torch on. I think we'll see everything tripping over my own shoelaces and not being as quick as James. So, it's a, not far away. I used to be. I don't know what's gone wrong. Um, and then finally, you know, I think if you put that team together, put that 4-4-2 formation together, you've got the chance of not letting many goals in at the back and creating a few chances. But, but in my mind, the way to, to sustainably create chances is realise that even if you've got a good product today, it won't be a good product tomorrow. Take a good look at Chelsea right now, Chelsea terms of Chelsea fan. And just recognise that that constant sort of self-regeneration, it, it just going to happen. And there'll be a lot of false tops of hills. Be okay with that and recognise it's very hackneyed, but recognise that actually it's about the journey, not the destination, because you'll never actually reach the destination. So with that in mind then, I, I guess it was just a bit of a slightly random rattle through 50 months. So 50 months from kitchen table to the biggest advertising service company in the world. Um, it literally has 180,000 people in there, I haven't mentioned. Maybe more than about 180 yet. Uh, and I guess it's those 11 things probably that kept us saying, kept us challenged in equal measure. Um, I hope that's been of some use, um, of some interest. I wouldn't claim for a minute we got everything right. Um, but I think they're probably, oh, I'm never going to do this again. I mean, I'm far too proud of, of this first spin around the block. There's far too much still to achieve there. Um, but I would hope that some of those things, if I did do it again, would be, certainly be the things I'd pass on to my son as, as things to take with him on the journey. Um, so with that in mind, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Awesome. Feel free to say no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just blown away by what you've heard. Were they grass, were they? They were grass. Wow. Yeah, that was the uh, that was the cricket pitch. Yeah, it, uh, it went out. Well, not quite sitting on cricket. Well, I guess it was sitting on cricket pitch. Huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Well, look, guys, that's my email address um, and all that nonsense. But I'm basically here a lot, hopefully playing again soon while well, kids mm -hmm. play here a lot. So thanks for coming mm -hmm. and um, hope this was some use. No, massively appreciate you coming. Really, really cool. appreciate Pleasure. you coming. And um, I think, you know, just linking back to what we're doing with Childs and, and the objective of Childs being, you know, to help organisations, individuals, teams and organisations win. And if we, if we define winning as kind of identifying, mobilising, gathering all your resources to go as far as you can, as opposed to I win, you lose type of scenario, I mean, I think that would be an incredible example of winning. You know, how, how Matt and his team have, have kind of identified, gathered, and then this kind of idea of actually mobilising all of those resources into something that is just really quite incredible. And um, Matt did give me sight of the of the presentation before he's 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 done it, but um, it, you know it, it, it made so much more sense when uh, to me <laughs> when when you're up there, you know, powerfully talking about what you've done and um, clearly how much emotional investment there is into what you've done. So um, yeah, really really big thank you. I've taken away a load, and I know you know you guys will have taken away a lot from tonight. That's right. That's so, um, yeah. There's a couple of bits that are a bit fine confidential that I couldn't share, but if you want any of the uh, anything shared, I'm happy to sanitise it and chuck it through over format. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Cool. Have Brilliant. a good night. That Radio Five thing on the on the Davis Cups on in a bit. For those of us trying to Cheers, guys. Cheers. 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 Cheers.
Yeah, I'm ready. 